Hi, preachers. This is Caroline Lewis. I wanted to remind you that you still have time to make an impact for millions. That's right. Millions of preachers. We would love to meet our goal of 75,000 before this Friday, May 31st, so that we can finish the campaign strong. We know you rely on the resources Working Preacher provides, so we are reaching out to you now to ask for your help to make sure we are able to continue providing those resources week after week. Every gift makes a difference. You will also receive a free ebook titled Sustaining the Preaching Life as a special thank you gift for supporting the campaign. This ebook was created to help preachers relearn ways to care for themselves and discover new habits to support their preaching life. This ebook is available only to donors of the spring fundraising campaign, so you must act quickly. You can make a one-time gift or a monthly gift securely online at workingpreacher.org. Thank you for supporting this vital ministry. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the second Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on June 2nd, 2024, are from Deuteronomy chapter 5, 12 through 15. And then we begin our semi-continuous reading through the Old Testament with 1 Samuel chapter 3, 1 through 10. And you can add verses 11 through 20. Psalm 81, 1 through 10. We also begin a six-week read through of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 5 through 12. And we are back in Mark. Welcome back to Mark, everyone. Chapter 2, 23 through 3, 6. We've had a long break from Mark. It's been a while. A lot of newness. That and semi-continuous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Second Corinthians. Yeah. Woo. Got to get our head around all that. All of this. I like where we jump back into Mark. I think it's it's a, an interesting pair of, of scenes here, and it really confronts us with some important Markin ideas right at the outset, which then helps the preacher kind of reorient people to where we are and where you're headed for the next several months. Mm. Well, do tell, Matt. Oh, well, just, you know, it's, uh, and, and Cliff Black in his commentary talks about the escalating conflict, but yeah, you get uh, the end of a series of controversy scenes. So you have to introduce people to who are the Pharisees and you have to introduce the Pharisees fairly and honestly, the way that Cliff Black talks about in in his commentary. You've also got uh, people who are there on the Sabbath to talk about Sabbath controversies as well and say, this is not a minor, insignificant, petty thing, what's going on here. This touches at the heart of Jewish identity in an increasingly encroaching Gentile world. And you've also got the question of, of motives and bad motives and what seems to have begun as relatively good-spirited or at least good-faith debates between Jesus and other religious leaders has now turned quite acrimonious, where they have now, they're lying in wait, they want to accuse him. And, you know, it's two chapters plus five verses have transpired in Mark before all of a sudden people want to kill him. Mm -hmm. And the people who want to kill him in chapter three, verse six, are Pharisees and Herodians who are uh, an odd set of political allies or people who have allied for the sake of uh, doing away with Jesus. They aren't the ones who at the end of the day finally are able to harm him, but it's remarkable how quickly things go from dialogue confusion to just outright hostility in this gospel. Yeah. And I think it's worth remembering that the last, I mean, we've had snippets of Mark Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, a couple in Lent and, uh, of course, Mark's Easter story. But really, the last time we had any sort of uh, continuous read-through of Mark was was in Epiphany. And so we left off at verse 39, uh, and, and he went throughout Galilee proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. And then... 
verses 40 through <laughs> to, you know, 22, uh, as you said, a, a lot, a lot has happened, uh, Matt. And, and so bringing people up to speed with that, uh, becomes really important, um, particularly for this passage in that you have what becomes at the heart of some of that conflict, well, for for G, for Mark's Jesus especially is is the questioning of Jesus' authority. Mm-hmm. By what authority does he have to interpret things the way he does? But in this case, the Sabbath, uh, and and what does the what does the Sabbath mean? And what and and how does one keep the Sabbath? And so, uh, it 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 puts. And, and then you get verse six, you know, the Pharisees went on immediately conspired with Herodians against him, how to destroy him. And we're only in chapter three. And as Ron Burgundy, yeah, as Ron Burgundy got, said, that, that escalated quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've got eight chapters left. Right. Uh, of this, right? Until, until uh, you know, through chapter 11. So, yeah, that's... And, Mark- Mark is known for writing quickly and um, for um, getting us to the to the meat of things um, immediately being that favorite word there. Um, but uh, I think the idea of it escalating um, is um, is again uh, something that uh, we might want to have folks recognize that uh, maybe too often we, uh, we present Jesus as sort of, uh, you talked about this a couple of weeks ago, Matt, as our buddy. And um, we forget just how disruptive. <laughs> not in Mark. <laughs> uh, not in yeah. Mark, no. We forget sometimes just how disruptive um, the, uh, the presence of God is to even those whose responsibility it is to set the cultural and religious practices of the community. And, and Mark yeah. definitely holds that front and center for us. Yeah, the commentary does a nice job, I think, helping us see what is disruptive. Uh, and and I think you can never say this too much as a preacher or a teacher because people forget it or don't know it, that Jesus is not coming in here saying, hey, all this law observant stuff is really a stupid idea. It's he's, in fact, what he says here about the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. There are other Jewish teachers of his time who say essentially the same thing. So mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's not like this is a new radical idea. What's new and radical is in verse 28 when he says, the son of man or I am Lord of the Sabbath. I mean, <laughs> now he's saying like, I'm not really interested in deliberations about the law. Uh, I'll tell you how to follow it. And that's shocking just as previously he appears to be comparing himself to David and in a sense Mm -hmm. kind Mm -hmm. of above the law in other words he's just out of place he's a little too close he's putting himself in the seat of authority that he that nobody appears to belong in right and he does it to try to recover the law right so then he says well we're going to heal this guy on the sabbath because that's what the sabbath is all about it's all about restoration and empowerment, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he's not running away from Judaism. He's, no. but he's he's certainly running away from the channels of authority, <laughs> or the reinterpretations think, of it. Yeah, and but and I think one of the important aspects of this is the way in which Jesus demonstrates that authority is is in part er, his authority and where that comes from is in part that invitation to interpretation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that, that, that I find interesting, uh, particularly, you know, in verse four, then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? Uh, well, that's ambiguous. <laughs> you know, what does do good? What does do good mean? Yeah. And, uh, and so how, how, you know, how would we respond to that? How will they respond to that? And, uh, and the way in which the way in which it, you know, it really does put, uh, it, it, it goes to how will you define, you know, how will you define life and how will you, um, honor and keep the Sabbath? And what does that, what does that mean? And so in that regard, it's, uh, it's, it's, 
what's so curious about this passage is that this it's this you know radical shocking claim the son of man is lord even of the sabbath and that uh uh but then but then demonstrates that 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 authority or that claim comes from a perspective of opening up dial i mean opening up interpretation and conversation about it if that makes sense so You've heard me say before, I'm, I'm, I like reading Mark through Isaiah, um, as uh, Ricky Watts does in, in, in uh, his interpretation of Mark, which looks at Isaiah as a rereading of the Exodus. So Isaiah becomes that central interpretation of uh, the liberation of Israel uh, that is recorded in Exodus. And then with that in one's imagination, Mark becomes the interpretation of all of that in light of an encounter with Jesus. And when you think about that, the prophets over and over again are saying to um, the those who are practicing worship that you're doing the right thing and it's not what you're asked to do. Your, um, your very worship is a problem because of the way that you treat your neighbor. And so this uh, move that um, Jesus does here in showing them what doing good is, where it actually results in, um, well, as the commentary makes a uh, statement on it, it feeding or healing um, is, is, is really what it means to love one neighbor, one's neighbor, what it really means to follow um, the Ten Commandments, which is, um, we've talked about before, is loving God by loving your neighbor. It should be, uh, it's, I think it's worth telling people as well that uh, the man with the withered hand in, in that society and that, econ- in that economy is potentially disadvantaged as well, an economy around Galilee that's largely built on, on manual labor, really? things like agriculture, fishing. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on there when we think about that man's condition potentially. And so to think about to what is he restoring him beyond just Mm -hmm. health or what kind of a body, there's also a sense of economic empowerment that's, that's there as well, which, you know, I don't know when we're ready to go to Deuteronomy, but ties us into that. The, the lectionary could have chosen Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy five. And I think they chose the right version. I agree. Deuteronomy five talks about the Exodus and as, uh, as, uh, as what's what I want, the rationale or the, the, the basis for the Sabbath commandment, as opposed to the cycles of creation. Yes. Yeah. And yes, um, yes, that's really key. I'll just say one more thing before we go there, but that is real, that is really important. And just to point out, uh, the commentaries, uh, statement, how will we feel when Jesus runs roughshod over whatever we consider definitive of Christian conduct, even when we find it in the Bible? Mm -hmm. And so that right there uh, is, I think, a a really important question for, uh, for for a preacher to think about, for churches to think about, but yes, to connect it to Deuteronomy, then it's it it becomes about freedom. Yes, right. And what is liberation? It mean? Yes. And what does it mean for it, this particular um, reading of the law, where in Exodus um, uh, the remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, God rested, we get to rest, but. The, and, and these words are in Exodus as well, but this connection, this clear connection to uh, liberation, what does it mean for those who have been working uh, in an unfair labor system 24-7 without what was needed uh, are told that you are commanded to take a day off? And, and in that, it's not just you take a day off for yourself, but everyone takes a day off. You take a day off. Your, your partner takes a day off. Your children takes a day off. Male and female takes a day off. Even your animals take a day off. And then your those pet. slaves and foreigners. This is, this is a complete counter identity of what it meant to be enslaved in a powerful empire 
And this is a commandment. So choosing this reading really uh, bolsters um, that that text you made us, uh, that commentary uh, a question you made us pay attention to, uh, Caroline, is um, how are we going to respond um, mm-hmm. when 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 what God is doing runs smack dab against what we think we have. The Sabbath is about liberation. It's about liberation. Mm-hmm. It's about freedom. It's 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 real life right now. You know, it, I I I I really love the difference between the Exodus and the De- Deuteronomy reading because yes, we are restored to being the image of God, but it is not a spiritual later on kind of thing. It's a right here and now. And one of the questions that uh, I've been asking my students uh, as we look at the Ten Commandments, that is a hard question. Um, what would it look like if we set up a society where everyone could have a rest day? And mm-hmm. we can't imagine that. And imagine what it meant for them. How do they imagine it after coming out of slavery? This is true mm-hmm. liberation. Good stuff. And the commentary on that's really good. Talking about rest as a gift and talking about how in some ancient societies, rest was reserved for the wealthy. He just simply couldn't do it if he didn't have those those privileges. Right. Um, and of course, the irony, and now we live in one of the richest societies ever, we've essentially given the Sabbath back because we prefer working and acquisition. But or we basically make people work for us, you know, right. seven days a week. to it's Exactly. Yep. Which is why that peace, not even your servants. Yeah. 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 You're not honoring the Sabbath. Yeah. I'm going to get in trouble for this one. You're not honoring the Sabbath because you don't cook and you go to a restaurant and make someone else cook for you. Uh, okay. So as I mentioned in the opening, we have now moved into our semi-continuous summer uh, summer journey through, in this case, the David cycle and starting, uh, well, we've got a couple Sundays before we get to David, we have to give have, have a little bit of background. There. Yeah. But, well, we got to uh, understand why, why they got a King and why they needed why they a, got king. a King in the first place. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so yeah. we've got first Samuel three, one through 10, and then option of 11 through 20. Can I propose that we not, what we not call it the David cycle? Okay. Yes. Okay. What would you like to call it? I just, I would want to, uh, I mean, you can do whatever you want, but I, I think if you're, if you're setting this up, if you're preaching and you're saying, hey, for the next X months, we're going to go through this. I would say not that we're around David, but we've moved away from Torah, which is where we were last year going through this. Mm-hmm. Um, the land has been, has been settled. I forgot exactly where we left off in November, but, uh, but you've got now, if we read Judges, we didn't read a lot of it, but right. basically now we're dropping in on the land's been possessed, settled, whatever language you want to use for it. And Torah, this magnificent vision of what a just society was supposed to look like, Torah, which was given in the wilderness, is now certainly not taking hold. And so we've got, I would read the last verse of Judges and kind of say, this is the context in which this is set. Mm -hmm. Things aren't going well. We've also got some very hard stories ahead of us Mm -hmm. just to talk about the ways in which the, the idealism of Torah and the giving of Torah just doesn't get institutionalized, just doesn't Mm -hmm. fit in. And even David, for all the ways in which the text is going to laud David, mm-hmm. is a bit of a mob boss. <laughs> He's, like you're going to have to take the bad with the good uh, or not. And so just to kind of set people up that this is a, a, a cycle or a series of stories where we're going to be left a lot of days saying, where's the good news in this? What have we learned today that we didn't already read in the newspaper? Yes. And, and in some ways, that's what makes the word a living word. Because it really does seem like with all the promises that we should have, with all the recognition of God showing up, uh, in light of the resurrection, shouldn't the followers of Christ be instituting a different way 
And just like the people of God in ancient days, we fail to do that. The, the, the good and just and righteousness of God has not occupied our imagination. And, and maybe we can begin in the same way uh, that uh, this reading from uh, 1 Samuel uh, 3 begins. The word of God, the voice of God was rare in those days. And there weren't a lot of visions. So what happens when you're not hearing from God? Or dare I say, when it seems that God is silent? And then the warning becomes, well, who's going to be that mouthpiece? So what would you want to call it, Matt? (laughs) Just, I don't know. I mean, in a sense where, well, you could... You could say we're we're moving into the prophets, and you could explain that in the uh, in the Jewish rendering of Scripture, yeah, this is now the prophets, as was Joshua and Judges. But that mm-hmm. yeah. one of yeah. the differences between Torah and the prophets is um, the prophets is when people start standing up and saying, "This isn't working for me." <laughs> Whether it's Amos saying, "I'll tell you exactly why it's not working." We're not going to do Amos this year, but, or whether it's the narrative section of the Deuteronomistic history, which is, yeah, Tor sounded really good in the wilderness when everybody was talking about it, but when they actually got power, they got land, or they got the possibility to do it, it's a lot harder to put those, those theological and political ideals into practice than you might think. And so, and we'll, we'll and really, not, oh, go ahead. We'll really talk about that next week in terms of that setup. I, I, I agree that it is a move from, from the Torah to the prophets. Um, but in the short sense, um, since we began, uh, we, uh, Caroline suggested that we, we uh, read the end of Judges. This is actually the setup for the kings. You know, you know, they're, 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 this is how they come about, uh, to make this request. Um, so before they get what becomes that Jewish writing division, from, from Torah to prophets, um, they lingered in this, um, well, again, I'm getting into next week, but they lingered in this, uh, we've got a little bit of power and let's, let's see if we can exercise it like everybody else. Yeah. I'm not sure David's much of a difference, but when we get to him, but yeah. So I didn't really answer your question. I guess if I had to call it something, I would say, (laughs) Hey, this really isn't working for me. (laughs) I like it. And to say what happens when that, because that happens in our theologies all the time, right? Mm-hmm. We think we're sailing along smoothly and all of a sudden somebody's like, yeah, this isn't working for me because those people aren't being fed or because those people aren't receiving justice or because mm-hmm. whatever. There's a hypocrisy in the system that needs to be called out. And I do think that this this narrative, large narrative chunk that we're entering into is a way of saying, a way of calling something out. Mm-hmm. Which makes the commentary uh, an interesting commentary on that in terms of the framing of it within the concept of obedience and, mm-hmm. um, you know, Torah as, as instruction and, and, and then of course the giving of the covenant and then how the, you know, covenants become harder to keep when you're farther away from the source <laughs> or from the, from yeah. the structures that that make them to that make uh that make covenants easier to keep um and where where is it that we want to where is it we might want to replace obedience with things of our own things of our own yeah. you know that's what not working for me anymore yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> but to get to the text right it starts with this beautiful story of great hope and and I would fill it in a little bit to make sure people know just how bad Eli's sons are yes. <laughs> I mean, these are the religious authorities and um, talk about mob bosses. I mean, they're just, they're shaking people down for religious services, so to speak. And so you have to explain who Samuel is. You might have to explain a bit about who Hannah is and her, is her husband Elkanah. Am I remembering that correctly? Mm -hmm. Um, But that's all worth doing because the story begins with hope. It's going to end. (laughs) <laughs> well, it's going to, I mean, Michael Chan taught me this, right? That, uh, that Joshua and 
Second Kings are both story. The story as a whole is bracketed by land loss, yes, mm-hmm. and the trauma of land loss and what that looks like, and stories mm-hmm. about land, mm-hmm. and um, and how again, and the commentary pulls this out, what that means when this is all being sifted through in the exilic period or in the or in the near post exilic period as well. That this is these are the writings of people who are trying to figure out what happened to us. Um, and it starts with hope, or at least a chance, if not hope. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm talking too much, but <laughs> no, no, no. This is this is so spot. I love the Samuel story, right? Yeah, I mean, it you have to- it's it's a beautiful story, and the setup is is really important for you to understand what what this scene is, where um, just how bad Eli's sons were, and uh, the reality that Hannah has prayed for this son saying that if you give me a child, I'll give them back to you. God does. She does. So now her son is being raped by this man who's failed to raise his own sons. And when we really learn about Samuel is they haven't heard from God. God speaks. And Samuel has to tell Eli, okay, God's been watching. God's not happy. And God's going to do something about it. And there's this glimmer where Eli actually says, okay, boy, now that I remembered God speaks and uh, I told you to listen for him, you better tell me exactly what he said. And he knows it's not going to be good. If you hold back anything, may it happen to you. And, And so there's a reality of all of this negative that you've mentioned, Matt, which is why we have to give that background in order for us to recognize that, can I say this and you catch the echo, in this child is the hope for the future? Yeah, I love how Samuel's first prophecy is to tell Eli, like, yeah, you're going to lose it all. And Eli's like, yeah, that tracks. Um, But yeah, again, Samuel's not called in a vacuum. He's called in a very precarious, just awful social landscape. And there's a courage to what he has to do, at least here at the beginning. He gets a little ornery towards the end. (laughs) Even after he's dead and they call him back, he's still ornery. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. Uh, The psalm. I would, since you have the reference in verse 10, uh, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, I would, I would set that up with, uh, with Mark and Deuteronomy, um, and the way in which you can connect, connect the Psalm or use language from the Psalm, if that's the direction that you go. So that's all I've got in the Psalm. I'm going to, I'm going to back you up. Uh, I literally drew a line through verse one to say, rather than starting there, let's start with um, uh, verse nine and 10, which is uh, the reminder of who God is and to place no other God before him. Yeah. Yeah. I'd start in verse seven, but I'm I'm with you till verse 10, but yeah. We are adding a little bit more. (laughs) I know we're always, we're expansionist people here at Sermon Brainwave. Yes, generous, we generous. We are. Yes. All right. Well, that's settled. Uh, and now uh, we begin with Second Corinthians, and we've got mm. six Sundays working through Second Corinthians, but we drop down in verse or chapter four. <laughs> so <laughs> right in. might need to do just a tad of setup for what second Corinthians is all about, uh, if you decide to do, but I do like it though, when the lectionary offers these built-in sermon series, you know, if you're wondering what, you know, what, what taking on a particular challenge or something that you maybe even for your own learning and edification that you haven't spent much time in a particular book, nor has your congregation uh, to say, well, we're going to, we're going to take on second Corinthians for six weeks and see where that takes us. I thought you were anticipating John six already here in (laughs) early June. Uh, No, because we don't, they, you'll, you'll base, you will be done with 
uh, Corinthians before you get to John 6. You got about six weeks to plan your vacation, preachers, before John 6 comes. No, yeah. So you'll be done with 2 Corinthians on the 7th of July, and then you've got two more Sundays before you get to John. So you could, yeah, you could, uh, yeah. Anyway. I think in our, in our, our, Current cultural moment in the reality, it's it is important to set up just what uh, ancient Corinth was like, and um, uh, to bring back the recognition that Paul is speaking into uh, a very diverse context uh, in the midst of a system of philosophies and religious diversity, and um, he pauses and says, "All I got is Jesus." That's all we got for you. And um, that in the midst of all the trials and tribulations, um, what if we turn our attention to the reality of God as made known in Jesus? And to not, I want to linger there just a moment uh, because the text, uh, the lectionary allows us to do that, to not shy away from. Um, just how extraordinary it is to make an argument for the presence of God in Jesus before we get to any other promise that we want to make in a broken and uh, hurting world. Yeah, there is something about, I like the way you went into that, Joy. I was wondering where you were going at the start, and I, I get it and like it. So, I mean that uh, Paul is Paul and his companions are on the outs with the folks in Corinth. First Corinthians didn't work so well. They appear to have unified themselves against Paul. <laughs> and said, yeah, we don't really like you. And they had some other, they had some bad letters that went back and forth. They had a bad experience. And so Paul is trying to get back into their good graces. I mean, in an honest way. And he does it in a deeply theological presentation to talk about Christ as the basis of reconciliation and Christ as the basis of their own shared ministry, which, you know, um, isn't the way that a lot of people think about the church and its ministry necessarily in terms of what that, what that looks like. Um, so you said to me, all we have is Jesus. I, th I see a similarity. I think what, the way kind of I'm going in there as well. And it, it makes me think about what does that mean for our preaching? Mm-hmm. In terms of you know you know the behind the scenes part of this mm -hmm. podcast, like in terms of preachers preparing for this, but also how you how you teach people to talk this way, how you teach people to perceive the church's unity in this kind of Christocentric, deeply theological way, which is not which is Christocentric, but but not only that in this particular passage, the focus on that. Christocentrism is just extraordinary vulnerability. Yes, uh, and that that's what we're that's what we hold on to uh, when you think of again going back to naming the context joy of of Corinth and mm -hmm. and its um, its entrapments or mm -hmm. its uh, its um, yeah it, it, the the context of that that the that the that the direction the the direction that paul points is not to the glory but to the clay jar that mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that is vulnerable to being broken and and puts puts the ministry puts his ministry and the ministry of the gospel within that reality vulnerable. Um, and that's and then that's what and that's what we hold on to and we hold on to the death and the body and the in the affliction and the persecution uh and uh and that's 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 then the mark of the mark of the good news <laughs>